This time on episode 424 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we talk Moon Knight Season 1, maybe series finale, Episode 6, Gods and Monsters. Weekly Marvel Studio news, including Neil Adams passing away and his historic career, the Fantastic Four needing to find themselves a new director, and Marvel Studios swapping MCU release dates like the NFL Draft Day trades, and your feedback, including your questions on the Moon Knight finale. I'm Stephen John Drew from Better Podcasting, a podcast about podcasting, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find fantastic geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. You have been granted clearance by director Alfonso Mac McKenzie. Stand by for a shield debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the shield director. Now it's time for your scout debriefing. I'm Agent Michelle. I'm Agent Chris. I'm Consultant Anthony. And I'm producer of the show, Director SP. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a Marvel Comic Universe fan show discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Comic Book Universes as told on screen by Marvel Studios. This show is recorded on Thursday, May 5th, 2022, Happy Cinco de Mayo, live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and broadcast Mooncast Wide. Come and join our live chat. Guys, happy National Astronaut Day. I'm so excited, I'm just over the moon about it. And that's why I let you have the space. <laughs> Listen, Doc takes all the puns on my show, so I have to get them in where I can. National Astronaut Day was started in 2016 by the Unify Space Agency, which is a division of Unified Good LLC, to inspire everyone to reach for the stars. Now, I don't know why they thought it was a good idea to choose May 5th, which is Cinco de Mayo, but they did. so. I like astronauts, so it's Happy National Astronaut Day. There you go. Did you want to say something, Chris? I just really want to go play in the underwater pool that the astronauts train in, but mostly I was reaching for the stars on one of my monitors, and I couldn't reach it. I want to take a ride in a vomit comet. Do you really? Yes. Okay. Yes, I do. Sincerely. Been there, done that, got the vomit. I have an ironclad stomach, and I know everybody goes, yeah, I thought I did. And like, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I just think it would be cool to just float. Have you ever been up in a high-performance aircraft? Doesn't matter if it's a prop, a jet, fighter. Nope. Okay. Chris, I think you said you were in line to do it at one time. I was going to for my 15th birthday, and then 9-11 happened, so they decided I wasn't allowed to do that anymore. All right. If you want to try out, like if you think you were, I'm not talking to you guys, I'm talking to our listeners right now. If you want to try out to see if you can do something like the Vomit Comet or astronaut training or anything like that, go get yourself a ride in a high performance aircraft. If you do not throw up, then it might be something that you want to look into for the future. But if you do, might want to second guess yourself and maybe put your energies into something else. Just saying. For the uh, sake of a lot of people that I know that have either wanted to become uh, fighter pilots or astronauts, and they ran into that motion sickness thing. Same with uh, sailors, too, by the way. It's the same sort of thing. If you want to sail and that's what you want to do with your life and you get seasick, that's going to suck for you because some people don't get over it. So a lot of people do, but some people don't. So it's not all water world out there. Maybe we should just stick with eating right before we get on Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. I guess that's another thing. It, amusement parks, right? Because a lot of people get motion sick in amusement parks, especially with the more advanced rides that they have at, say, uh, Disney World or, you know, uh, the, the Marvel parks. You don't need advanced. Just come join me on the teacups. If you can keep your lunch down there, you'll be okay. All right. There you go. I broke a teacup once. You broke it? Yes. Like, not the teacup side, right? You broke, like, the, it spinning? They tried to break tried to apply the brakes when it was over and i guess for whatever reason 
something and I just hear like screeching and it's still spinning. So now I have to counter turn. It wasn't just me. It was me, my father, my sister, but still. Wow. What the athlete. I'm impressed. All right. So with that, we will leave astronaut day and thank you to all the astronauts out there for everything you do. I know it is a lot that you do and you devote your lives to it. So thank you very much. And I'm envious, but in the meantime, we're going to continue on because we love talking about Marvel. Because negotiations are fun. If you want to try to negotiate yourself onto a wonderful podcast network, maybe you should go check out some options at legendsofshield.com. You can leave us a voicemail about your best deal on our line, 844-THE-BEST-1. That's 844-843-2871. If you want to lie about your negotiation tactics and how they always work, one of the best places to do that is on Twitter. And make sure to tag us when you do it at Legends of Shield. We're on YouTube, youtube.com slash gonna geek. If you think that you can negotiate better than me, come find out at Discord at gonna geek.com slash Discord. And remember, Legends of Shield is a proud member of the gonna geek.com network. And perhaps maybe if you want to learn more about negotiation techniques, you might want to find yourself a lawyer. So uh, we happen to have one in the house. Anthony, thank you for joining us again for the last episode of Moon Knight, at least this year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I was here for the overwhelming majority of these episodes and uh, I certainly wasn't going to miss the finale. So uh, thank you all for having me back and uh, looking forward to having what's going to be, I think, an interesting discussion. I think so as well. So with that, let's get into Moon Knight. Moon Knight Episode 6, Gods and Monsters, premiered on Disney Plus Wednesday, May 4th, 2022. The IMDb description reads, as Moon Knight joins the fray, Mark, Stephen, and Conchu must work together to stop Ahmed. Michelle, who directed the episode? This episode is directed by Mohamed Dayeb, who has four directing credits starting in 2010, including six episodes of Moon Knight and wrote The Island and The Island 2. Chris, we had a main story by slash writer for the episode. And the writer for this one was Danielle Iman, who has four writing credits going back all the way to the year 2022. One episode of Riverdale and this episode of Moon Knight. Jeremy Slater is also credited with a writer credit for the episode. By the way, he's the showrunner for Moon Knight. All right, we're just going to jump right into it. I know everybody's waiting for it. The Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. exclusive synopsis. You won't get this anywhere else. It is only here on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. And we're going to start off with Anthony. Viewers are treated by an appropriate song, The End, by Earl Grant, as Mark Spector is fished out of the water and Harrow takes Amit's Ushapti and Mark is left with the magical scarab. Harrow is off to heal the world, and after saying goodbye to Mark, Layla decides to tag along like Marty McFly does with his skateboard behind Jeeps. You're welcome, 1985. Harrow's power is on full display at a desert checkpoint where Taro reanimates dead people to tell Layla to wait until Mark returns. So what? Totally normal here. Everything is perfectly fine. A brief, disappointing battle occurs in the pyramid where the avatars lose miserably to Harrow, and Amit decides to allow Harrow to be her avatar despite having unbalanced scales. Layla frees Khonshu but firmly declines to be his avatar in one of the best moves any character has made in the MCU, and then he tries to rekindle his old flame with Amit. Meanwhile, in the field of reeds, perfection is not enough for Mark without Stephen and he decides to leave to be with his inner self forever. MCU magic rekindles Mark's and Steven's shared heart, and Towerit rides the sand waves to give them the chance they need to reanimate and live again with Khonshu. Steven and Mark wheel and deal with Khonshu before jetting off to Cairo. 
Layla decides to team up with Tarouet as Harrow slash Amit and his merry band bring the joys of judgment to everyone. An epic moonlit battle of the gods commences as Harrow and Mark spar over who's going to pick up the dinner check in the middle of town. Layla joins the fight as Mr. Knight and Moon Knight swap rounds. It's effectively three against one. Or is it? Since both Steven and Mark black out, seriously, was this gimmick carried out too long in the series? Mark and Layla defeat Arthur Harrow, but Mark, Steven, and tell Khonshu to kill Harrow himself. What? Just, just what? What, what, what just happened? Seriously? Dr. Harrow is bloody in his office as Steven and Mark decide to walk. Later, Gators. Mark and Steven find themselves back in Steven's flat as the credits roll. But wait, there's more. As sedated Arthur Harrow is wheeled out to a limo, he sees Conchu, who introduces Jake, who's Conchu's favorite. Jake Lockley shoots Arthur without any hesitation. And that is the epic Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. exclusive synopsis of the episode. All right, Michelle, let's go on with your first thoughts. This was all backdoor pilot for Layla's own show, right? Right? There were some really great fights in this one, including some ones that we probably didn't see. I was glad to see most of my predictions from last week came true, but it was still a little bit of a letdown. My prediction from last week came true. Woohoo! Oscar Isaac did star in an episode on Star Wars Day, May the 4th. This was great. I'm so proud of myself for guessing that correctly. It was so much work and so much logical, critical thinking that went into that. I'm proud of myself, guys. I, I really am. You should hit the casino with that kind of luck. I think so, yeah. That, we should end this right now so I could go. Yeah. All right. So Chris asked for us to start our main discussions at one point and we all kind of were like, yeah, okay. And then we all kind of were starting to talk about it. And then Michelle wisely said, no, 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 wait, wait, save it for the show, save it for the show. So we're going to talk about it here on the show. And that is the moment in the fight on the street where you had Moon Knight, Mr. Knight and Layla out there battling Haro. And all of a sudden, there was a blackout and then the sort of thing. And then Moon Knight's in control of Haro, where he was getting beaten before. So let's start talking about that. Chris, what are your thoughts? I liked that part because it showed to me, at least, that we've seen Jake throughout the entire series. This was the first really super concrete thing in my eyes that said, hey, there's Jake, because everything else could have been Mark, could have been Steven, you don't know. But this is the first one where you have Mark coming out saying, "Uh, no, this wasn't me. I don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah, I do agree that the introduction of Jake and that whole thing in the last episode kind of felt a bit rushed. Then again, there's a lot about the series that felt rushed, so I'm not entirely surprised. And I think to try and introduce a third alter in the series prior to this episode would have been that much harder to cram into six episodes as it was. We could have introduced Jake last episode because we had the whole heart thing. You know, we need a third heart. Where is it? Oh, who are you? I'm Jake. We got this really cool scene. We had Haro with the staff and then there was this purple glow. And I'm thinking that Disney Plus spent most of the budget to get Oscar Isaac because that fight would have been epic and memorable but instead we just got some broken stuff people on the ground and oscar isaac confused great way to save money disney i'm with you michelle the whole three hearts thing i think that's something that requires 
a explanation, which is not good because we're at the end of the series. Disney Plus, I don't think, or Marvel Studios doesn't have any other plans for another Disney Plus series on Moon Knight, at least for now. So I don't know where they're going to explain anything unless it's articles. And I had my rant about that back in episode four on if you have to explain stuff afterwards. And that is one thing that if the scales aren't balancing and yet they balanced at the end, I don't understand that whole third individual and the heart and the scales balancing and stuff like that. As far as Jake showing up, I got a little old of the trope where the individual's blacking out and then something happens and then you're like, okay, who is that? So I think at the start, you could have gone back and forth with Mark and Steven, but it's at the point now where, okay, we've seen it a little bit too much. I think we've seen it a couple of times before, Chris, where you really couldn't explain it one way or the other but maybe i'm remembering it wrong and you're right on that i don't know but jake coming in the final season or final scene a post credit scene for a series that doesn't have a sequel right now disney plus doesn't have any plans to move forward with another season i don't know that ending the ending scene itself was a little bit hard to stomach. I mean, I understood at the very end where we were in the limo, but that's another thing I want to talk to you guys about. The whole, we're going to move from the fight into the institution again, and then back into the real world. I am so confused on where things actually were. And you no, know, Anthony, in my mind, as I'm watching the episode, I'm like, are we doing some time travel here? Because you mentioned that before. And I don't think that was the case. So I just got really confused at the end. Maybe one of you have a great explanation about how the ending actually occurred. I don't have a way to explain it. I admit I was a little confused as to how real the sequence with the institution was. I did appreciate the Sienkiewicz Easter egg. Bill Sienkiewicz one of the basically like the first iconic artist for Moon Knight and in many ways still 40 plus years later uh, continues to be the iconic artist for Moon Knight. But it was a situation where we see prior to that the sequence with Harrow, but his feet are bloody and Stephen slash Mark are like, oh, you see that? Yeah, I see that. Okay. So I was like, is that real? He's already been brought back, so is he dreaming this? And then Harrow's in the institution, and I'm going, okay. Um, how is this? I'm assuming this is real, but I'm also not clear when and how all of this is taking place. Did appreciate Conchu in the badass suit that fits with the, the Declan Shalvey drawing of him. And the flat cap and the appearance of Jake Lockley was basically straight out of the comics. He's just missing the mustache. But to that point, the whole sequence just seemed like, uh, we need to give these people Jake somehow, so let's just tack this on at the end. I mean, how else could you have really brought Jake in, though, at this point, if you're going to? I realize that... They don't necessarily have a season two planned, although they did open the doors by taking down a tweet saying that this was the series finale and changing it to the season finale. They've already passed up the opportunity with the sarcophagus that they didn't go open. They passed up the opportunity with the third heart that could have balanced things out. And if you're going to get Jake, you've kind of run out of time which really is their own fault because they're the ones who decided this was going to be a six episode series. Yeah. Let's talk about pacing. Let's talk about pacing for the series. Let's talk about pacing for the episode. Michelle, I know you have some thoughts. It's again, three, you get like the first episode where you get a little setup. you get three 
more episodes of setup and trying to get things going. And I found this video by Screen Crush because there was something, again, everybody was like loving episode five, but then there was just something about it that just wasn't sitting right. And one of the people was like, this is again, Disney plus Marvel shows paint by number. One episode to introduce things, plot, 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 maybe some, some character development, sometimes not just taking forever to really get anywhere. The fifth episode being reflective. And when this person started, when he started talking about it, he's right. WandaVision, episode five was the flashback in Agatha. Loki got to talk to himself in Falcon and Winter Soldier. Sam comes to terms with themselves and talks to Isaiah. And here it is, the fifth episode, we get that flashback again. And I think this is part of it. It is, for some reason, a paint by numbers that needs to stop. Because it's getting to the point where She Hulk better not be like this. And they're doing a Loki season two. What if they keep this up for another moon night? What are we going to have? Three episodes of Jake and Conchu. The way Jake has been introduced, my mom and I, 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 mom had watched this. I did not tell her anything at all because I wanted it from someone who had no clue. And mom had no clue. She fell for Stephen and Mark. She really got into their relationship she liked episode five when they reconciled she really liked the fact that they were fighting together and then at the end with jake and she's just like wait that's just a cold-hearted killer no wonder why Kanshu likes him they're both dicks and i'm like going yeah i <laughs> she actually that's what she said i'm like going yeah mom you're right they are both dicks i don't want a season two where i have to sit around and watch two dicks do whatever for three to four episodes until we get steven and mark back i mean i'm with you here a season two one of the things i really like about comics is that as you end a story arc you kind of get the next one starting and even if you don't get a really good idea of what's happening you get something more than oh look here's my killer alt personality i don't know what they can do with a season two Granted, that's coming from somebody who isn't a big Moon Knight fan, just because I don't know a lot of, about what could be going on. But I'm not seeing the end of this and, oh, I have to have more Moon Knight. I can totally understand and appreciate that. Obviously, as a Moon Knight fan, I'm going to continue to follow and support the character and hope that they show up. But I absolutely understand that point of view from someone who's not a diehard. And the thing for me that kind of frustrated me about this show is it's, it's called Moon Knight, but, and I know this is one of Michelle's point, but this goes not just for the finale, but for the show as a whole, it's very big on character, very short on actual Moon Knight. And I think it's because you had to spend so much time building up the Stephen and Mark back and forth, back and forth, as I'd indicated in one of the earlier episodes, they had the story that they wanted to tell. And then Moon Knight almost became an afterthought because they wanted to make this about DID. They wanted to make this about mental health. And listen, not every Marvel movie, not every Marvel show has to be all punchy, punchy, fighty, fighty. I get that. I just think that this may have gone a little too much in the other direction so i think that you can swing the pendulum back towards the other direction now that you've established mark and stephen and in theory jake to some extent that maybe the future appearance is going to be mark and stephen not realizing that they're still tethered to moonlight moon Knight because jake is now the one in control of the costume that Mark and Steven have been released from Conchu's control 
being his avatar, but he still has Jake and he still has the body. And then the three of them have to figure out how to work together. I'm imagining that's what's likely going to happen for some kind of a, either a season two or an appearance in a movie or an appearance in another Marvel series. I suppose, and again, yeah, that was one of my big points. I actually took notes that we did not get to Mark until 13 minutes into the episode, which was fine because I like Layla and Anthony was right. We needed to find out what she was up to while Mark was in the big sand yonder. Then at 19 minutes in, we got Moon Knight. And then about six minutes later, we didn't have Moon Knight. Because at the 30 minute mark, we had Harrow beaten up. So at the 24 minute mark, we had um, Moon Knight versus Harrow. We barely got, I think if we put all these hours together, maybe total we got 30 minutes of Moon Knight out of six hours of television with stars Moon Knight. We didn't have to chase for so many things, right? We had a chase for the sarcophagus. Wait, we had a okay. We had to find the scarab. Then we had to find a sarcophagus. Then we had to find a, a star map. Then we maybe we didn't have to find so many things, and we could have moved up some of that character thing for some reason. I think if they would have not been like, oh, the fifth episode needs to be the flashback thing before our sixth. If they were like, hey, maybe that would be better as the third episode, we could have gotten to Egypt quicker. We didn't have to find one of the thingies that they went to go find, which I don't know, didn't need, end up needing to be. I, I was so scared for anyway. I still, I wanted more Moon Knight in the Moon Knight show. There you go. I mean, you had to find the scarab so that you could get to Ahmet's burial site. Which then was rendered useless because Harrow took the scarab, so all of that chasing the scarab time could be seen as wasted time. You can go either way with that. You had to find the star map because you lost the scarab, which I think is even more kind of maybe almost wasted time. Because then that's two different things that you're finding just to find the same one endpoint. Then you find the sarcophagus, but you have to go find yourself inside of yourself, inside of your mind. So that's some more wasted time looking for things. And this kind of gets a little bit Where's Waldo. I wish we had had a little bit more Moon Knight along the way as well. The ninja like Moon Knight of doing things of trying to sneak up and stuff like that. I think that would have been useful along the way. But it is what ultimately we got. And that brings me to a broader question as well. Prior to this series, I guess, and I forgot about this until I was looking at some news for this week, the production team had come out and said, yeah, it's not really connected to the rest of the MCU, which is a point that I made before in the show notes, before I did some research, is that where is this connecting with the whole MCU? Now, Michelle, I know episode one, you're like, okay, where is this actually going? And following episode six here, I'm of the same ilk. Where is this going? What is the connection with the MCU? Anthony, I get your point where we're going to see Oscar Isaac before you don't get Oscar Isaac unless you plan to use him a little bit more. Like his contract is not just for the Moon Knight series. It's for X amount of appearances in X amount of Marvel Studios stuff. But and there is no direct connection here. We didn't get crossovers. They talked about wanting two crossovers, like one in episode one and one epi in episode six, and we didn't get either. As a viewer, you're like, okay, why do I care about this? You know, where does it go? Even in the original Iron Man, which I, not every property that Marvel Studios does needs to have a tie-in or a coda scene or a post-credit scene or a mid-credit scene. But in this particular case, it would have been nice to have something even in Iron Man, you had that I have the Avengers initiative for you at the end with Samuel L. Jackson. We didn't get anything in this. And I think for me, that was lacking because I'm big into the world building. I'm like, okay, where is this in 
the world building. I guess this is a single character movie sort of thing. If you think in terms of the MCU, but it was just lacking for me there. And if we're going to get more of this, I get it. You can't connect everything. Kevin Feige just said, we just got back from our retreat last week. We talked about it and we've got our plans for the next 10 years. Maybe they didn't have a concrete plan. So like, we don't want a connection in here. I read a couple of the connections that they wanted to make. I'm not going to say them here because I do believe them to be a bit of a spoiler if they do it in the future, but I don't know if I'm even okay with one of them. So I'm glad that they didn't do it, but still it was lacking to me. So I'm just wondering from you guys and Michelle, I think we've got your thoughts on it, but I'm wondering from all three of you is how do you feel about this not being connected to the MCU? Anthony, start with you. I mean, I think, from a character standpoint, and I've indicated this before, Moon Knight very much likes to do his own thing. I'm sure that it's a situation where he'll be off doing whatever it is that he's doing. And then if at some point it maybe comes up that he needs some help or somebody else says, hey, we need the assistance of this Egyptian guy with multiple altars who also has powers you know of a moon god then we'll call him i would just like to see a good story for me that's the first and foremost the connection to the mcu is secondary i just want to see the character done well and i want to see i want to see a story that involves a version of the character that i'm familiar with and that resonates with me as a fan of the character and then everything else to me is secondary. If they want to put Moon Knight entirely in his own thing, if they want to treat him like a Sony thing or whatever, that he's off doing his own stuff, then I'm cool with that. Just make it legit Moon Knight. We know this is post blip because of an ad on the bus. And if you miss the ad on the bus, you don't know when this is. His passport's going to have any kind of date on him. There's, I know what at least one of the connections is that I'm pretty sure SP is not mentioning, which I am also not mentioning. And I'm excited about the one that I'm thinking of. But how important is it? I don't know yet. That being said, I'm cool with Moon Knight being his own thing right now. Yeah, I just wanted to step in and say, I think the one that I'm thinking of, it's probably different than yours, actually would have ruined the story because the story had something else in it here. Could you just say, because you're confusing my brain, just say it. All right. Well, it's a romantic relationship with somebody that we've already seen in the Hawkeye series. If Mark Spector is having a romantic relationship with somebody he can't be married to Layla so it would have ruined the series would have ruined the storyline but Michelle what did you think about the connection with the MCU now after you've seen the whole series I just wanted to know when it was really what got me was the whole killing people before they could do anything bad I'm just like Emma, you just needed Thanos. I just feel like those two would have been like BFFs or something. Because also, I did not really feel the threat. What was the threat? She was the whole, oh, that's what she's doing. She's judging people and then they're falling, you know, they're dying and stuff. But it came halfway through the last episode. If you think about it, WandaVision, we knew right away, we thought either Wanda was being trapped or manipulated. We knew something was wrong. We knew what it, an idea of what was wrong with Falcon and Winter Soldier. Sure, we weren't really too sure who was the bad guy, but we knew there was terrorists and we knew there was other things and what the possible dangers were. We didn't know where it was going. Loki. I got caught by the time cops. I don't want to be. I want to escape. 
So what was the threat? We can't have her, but I don't know who she is. At least with, we had an idea about Thanos and why Thanos was so, you know, awful. She almost felt like a poor carbon copy of that. So I just wanted, I just want to know when this was why it mattered, even if it was only in Moon Knight's own little corner of the MCU. Why is he needed anywhere at all? Like, what is his special thing? Because I know Anthony was talking about, like, werewolves and vampires and stuff. I and mean, it's like, okay, it could be in the corner of the MCU where there's werewolves and vampires and stuff. I don't need Spider-Man and everybody to come up. I just needed to know when it was and why is Moon Knight needed for what he does? That's really all I needed. Well, we did end up with some pretty cool fights at the end with a villain that might not be that villainy. I mean, the best villains out there, I think, are the ones where you really get a development with. You really know how evil they are. I mean, they might look nice but then they turn around and it's like ooh you're really evil or you walk down the path with them and you see their journey and you're like oh I can kind of sympathize with you and then boom they do something really bad and you're like ooh but that ends up in the fight so maybe it was just a way to get Moon Knight to fight which I mean we've already talked about how we didn't get a lot of Moon Knight but we did get a decent fight in here and I will say that we got an awesome fight with Layla, who is now super powered because she's an avatar, quote unquote, temporarily. But I think if you take a look at the series and you take a look at the series with the development of Layla, you're like, okay, well, I, I can see that. You know, you got the fantastic acting of Oscar Isaac, but you, what you really see is this origin story for somebody that you didn't even think you were going to get with Layla. I don't know, maybe. You can't forget, too, that my prediction was also right. We got our giant monster growth Power Rangers fight, but we got the bonus shades of Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo, where you had the big fight going on between Khonshu and Amit, but then you also had the smaller fight mirroring that between Harrow and the Moon Knight Layla combination. Yeah, I was not expecting a kaiju fight as the backdrop for the finale of Moon Knight, but as someone who grew up watching the Godzilla movies, I was absolutely here for it. I was like, okay, let's do this then. And uh, I'm sad that we didn't get to see more of it. I was honestly hoping that maybe the beatdowns of the avatars would have effects on the gods or vice versa but it just seemed like they were independent of each other and to the point that when jake had beaten seven shades out of harrow and killed everybody else which we didn't get to see and they're dragging harrow off so they can imprison amit amit is similarly dragging Kanchu off so it was very interesting uh, so from my perspective i would have liked to have seen maybe a little more connection between the avatars and the gods yeah like i said i i wanted more moon knight i wanted more fight i like i did like the god fight we were predicting that layla would just break all of them but she knew somehow she knew which one was Kanchu, even though she just found out about i mean she knew about like the suit and everything but I guess somehow she just knew that was Conchu. Maybe the pop Funko wall was labeled and we just didn't, didn't see the labels. I think maybe in her conversations with Mark, she knew to look for something with a very large beak on it, maybe. It, they're Egyptian gods. Every other one of them has a beak. <laughs> well, I mean, one was a crocodile, one was a hippo, or could have been. She's also Egyptian, though, right? So presumably she could know okay what they are. hold on just because you're a person who's egyptian doesn't mean you know about ancient 
and okay, I know her dad was like also an Egyptologist, and so was she, but still, and also somehow she knew the spell because she was an avatar. Oh, I yeah, guess. I got nothing for that one. I guess somehow avatars magically know how to know the spell for putting a god into a human. I think that comes from the godhood that it was more that because they both knew the spell and they were both saying it. So I would imagine it's a feature of being an avatar that you're imbued with the knowledge of the gods, including the spell. I got a little bit of Guardians of the Galaxy vibe from that little moment, you know, when they're all holding hands and they're all getting ready to have after the dance off, you know, at the end where they're getting ready to win with the Infinity Stone. I thought that scene was a little bit like it, but not really. And also, this series also did get us the first Egyptian superhero, right, on screen with the MCU. So there is a first. All right. I enjoyed the adventure. Not necessarily my favorite Disney Plus series. Final thoughts, guys? We'll start with Chris. Overall, I think this is going to not really be one I want to go back and watch a lot. And if I do, I'll probably watch it as either two or three movies, depending on what kind of time I have. Like, it's fun while you're in there. But I feel like you really need to at least pair the episodes up to make it worth it. Actually, Oscar Isaac keeps saying that he did not get himself tied down with a bunch of contracts because it's Oscar Isaac and Oscar Isaac likes to do what Oscar Isaac wants. He does something big and then he ends up in this tiny little independent movie. So from what I've read and what he says, he hasn't tied himself into one of those big Marvel contracts. And I'm happy for him because this is my least favorite Disney plus Marvel show. Well, to your point, Michelle Feige has said that they're not doing the six, nine picture contracts anymore that they were doing with the infinity saga that they're trying to move away from that because they want to give the actors a little more flexibility. It gives them the opportunity to maybe attract a higher level of talent that doesn't want to be tied down to those kinds of deals. To the point of where this ranks with the MCU Disney Plus shows, I waited a long time for some version of Moon Knight to appear on screen. And then when this was announced, I had to wait like two and a half years, close to three. To finally see it. And after watching every episode twice, once by myself and once with my wife, it's kind of sitting there with me. I would put this middle to bottom. I wouldn't say it's the worst. I think What If was a little more meandering. And Captain America Winter Soldier was similarly a little more pointless, or not pointless, but aimless. Aimless, that's the word I'm looking for. But this was not as good as Loki or WandaVision or even Hawkeye in terms of moving the the story forward and advancing it in a way that, that made sense for the characters. I'm a little bummed that I waited so long and I was like, six episodes of Moon Knight, I'll take it. And this is what I get. I'm hopeful that there's more, and I'm hoping that we can redeem the character in the MCU moving forward. I'll end with this. In episode one, I asked everybody, okay, what are the callbacks we're going to get in episode six? And honestly, I don't think any callback that we had in episode one made it all the way to episode six. I think we got callbacks, but they were in like episode four and five. They weren't in episode six. And poor Crawley just left on the street there in London. We never saw him again. So kind of sad about that, but it is what it is. And then the last thing for an experienced hitman like Jake Lockley to not put plastic down across the limo as he's going to shoot and possibly kill Arthur Harrow 
I mean, isn't that a breach of Hitman etiquette there? I mean, no plastic? Who says he's not going to burn the car? Oh, yeah. I guess if if we go on a theory that Mark Spector was the billionaire that he is in the comics, he can afford many, many limos. So you just get rid of this one and you move to the next one. Okay, I I can go with that one. All right. Well, Anthony, thank you very much for joining us for this. It wouldn't have made any sense to us whatsoever without you. So thank you very much for that. And I know our audience is very appreciative. You're very welcome. Well, we know that as we speak, Dr. Strange 2 is premiering in the theaters, but we're not going to cover it next week because I am not going to mandate that the agents here on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. go into theaters even now. So we're not going to cover it next week. We will be covering it in the future. In the meantime, next time, we're going to get back to our excellent X-Men, the animated series coverage with season three, episodes eight and nine, Savage Land, Savage Hearts, part one and two. I'm looking forward to getting back to that. In the meantime, we have some news for you from Marvel Studios. Starting with some sad news, Neil Adams, the legendary comic book artist who reinvigorated Batman and other superheroes with his photorealistic stylings and championed the rights of creators, has died. He was 80. Adams died Thursday in New York of complications from sepsis, his wife Marilyn Adams told The Hollywood Reporter. Adams jolted the world of comic books in the late 1960s and early 70s with his toned and sinewy take on heroes. First at DC with a character named Deadman, then at Marvel with the X-Men and the Avengers, then back at DC with his most lasting influence, Batman. I actually got to see him at a convention and got to, you know, he did a panel and he started talking about like his influences and he was, you know, talking about like Jack Kirby and Oh, you know, like, look at these panels and what you can learn from them. And it was a very interesting, he just took charge of, you know, his own panel and started just talking about comic book art and what you can do without words and how you can convey the action without words and how important the art is. It was, it was a fascinating, I was just sitting there just listening to him for an hour, talk about art, not even his art. He didn't even talk about his art. He was just talking about the people who influenced him. It was amazing. Yeah, I said right after he died, I forget exactly where it was that I said it, that without Neil Adams, there is no Bill Sienkiewicz, who, as we said, the premier artist on Moon Knight. And Bill, when right after Neil died, said, my artistic father has died. And Bill will be the first to tell you early on in his career, he was a Neil Adams clone. And then he found his own style that he eventually was able to adapt into the New Mutants and things of that nature. But without Neil Adams, there is no Bilson Kevich. There is no Jim Lee. There is no Casada. The impact that he had from an artistic standpoint cannot be overstated. But equally as important is his impact on creators' rights. Here is a man who, when he went back to work for DC, got them to acknowledge Siegel and Schuster as the creators of Superman, got them to acknowledge it on the books, got to fight for Finger and Kane to be credited as the creators of Batman, got to fought for so many creators to get their original artwork returned back to them so that they could turn around and either own it or sell it, that this was stuff that had been sitting in storage owned by DC and Marvel for, in some cases, decades. And Neil said, they drew this, they deserve to have it. So many folks are talking about the impact that Neil Adams had on comics as an art form, and every word of that is true, and he deserves all the flowers. He also deserves flowers for what he has fought for, for creator's rights, because without Neil Adams, there's no image, just as a concept and all of the things therein. He meant a lot to a lot of people. Yeah, me being a newer comics fan, 
I haven't seen a lot of his work outside of what people have been throwing up on the internet since he died. But seeing the reaction that everybody has had with this, both from fans like us to people working in the industry, this is definitely a guy I want to go back and check out, both on the artistic and the creator's right side of things, because I'm seeing so much of that from so many people. I met Neil at his booth at C2E2 when I was there, and that was really fun because we didn't really talk a lot about comics. He talked a lot about how he loved the events and he loved connecting with fans and how he loved just the space and what it had become. And I just enjoyed that short conversation, really short conversation. I was like passing through the booth or passing by the booth and I saw him and he was there alone and I just started chatting with him and he just loved to talk to somebody and then somebody else came into the booth and that kind of parted the conversation right there but yeah that was my interaction with him and it was awesome to see and i looked around at his art and everything when i was there i was like wow this guy has done a lot so the comic book industry has lost a lot with neil but he's left behind a great legacy so chris we do have some more news on the mcu yes we do john watts has withdrawn as the director of fantastic four the reinvention of the venerable Marvel comic series at Marvel Studios and Disney. Watts just finished directing Spider-Man No Way Home, which grossed $1.89 billion, I might add, to become the sixth highest grossing film of all time. But there's nothing sinister really going on here. Watts just decided he needs to take a break from the superhero realm after completing this Spider-Man trilogy. He was expected to make Fantastic Four be his next film, the third feature iteration of the franchise, and but the first since Disney acquired Fox, which used to control the franchise. Watts has spent the better part of the last decade directing and promoting the Spider-Man films after being hired off Cop Car, a small-budget indie thriller that premiered at 2015 Sundance. And he really just needs a breather. But Watts and Marvel have both confirmed his exit and said that it was an amicable exit. Sometimes people just need a break. What are you going to do? I think we've lost a little bit with Watts leaving the Fantastic Four. That said, there's a lot of great talent out there that can come in and take it over. And I know that Marvel Studios is going to give this franchise a lot of love because it has failed before. Let's go ahead. It's okay. We can say it. It's failed many times. So let's do it right this time. And I don't think Marvel Studios or Disney is going to be overbearing with it but you're just going to get a lot of help. So they could bring some new blood in somebody that's really excited about this. that can bring their own take into it because Kevin Feige's already said that they can bring their own take into it and then reinvigorate fantastic four on the screen as well as in the merchandising and the comic books and stuff like that, because this is the, the comic book first family, right? The fantastic four, uh, regardless of what you think about some individuals. So they might be reincarnation, some of them we'll see how this goes but i don't think this is a loss for the film itself in being successful but i do think watts could have brought some great things to it yeah i'm I'm a fantastic four fan and i was definitely looking forward to his take on this because i do like what he did with the spider-man trilogy and the way he was able to create believable relationships among Peter, Ned, and MJ, and the interfamily relationships in that dynamic is vital to Fantastic Four. You cannot have a Fantastic Four without that dynamic. Dare I say, you may not even necessarily need a villain if it's done right. That's how good the relationships are among the characters obviously i want to see a villain i want it to be dr doom but you need that dynamic between the four of them they are a family it's not a perfect family but they are a family and so i was hoping that he would bring that eye on the dynamic to the fantastic four so you know like sp said it's not a loss per se but i am a little sad 
as Chris shows us his Dr. Doom Funko. Yeah, you mentioned Dr. Doom there. I just recently acquired the Dr. Doom cover from earlier on in the current Fantastic Four series, which started in 2018, where Marvel restarted Fantastic Four as they were negotiating again for the rights for Fox Studios, which had the Fantastic Four film rights. So, yeah, we'll see where this goes. Michelle, you have any thoughts on the Fantastic Four? If you're going to do Dr. Doom, do Dr. Doom. Okay. No, he speaks in capitals in all caps. Yes. Okay, Anthony, rounding out our news for this week, we also have some more MCU film news. So, Marvel Studios Productions, The Marvels, and Ant Man and the Wasp Quantumania are swapping release dates, Disney announced last week. The Marvels, which is the sequel to 2019's Captain Marvel, was originally due to open in theaters. On February twenty seventh, uh, February seventeenth, twenty twenty three, and Quantum Mania, the third movie in the Ant Man series, was set to open on July eighth, twenty twenty three. Instead, Quantum Mania will now bow first in February, and the Marvels will debut in July. Insiders say this was merely a matter of Quantum Mania being further along in its creative process than the Marvels, as the former has wrapped principal photography, while the Marvels still has a bit more to go. Marvel Studios' other big theatrical release in twenty twenty three, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume three is still set to debut on May 5th. So we're going to get three films, February, May, July. Boom, boom, boom. To say nothing of the, what I'm sure will be a large number of Disney Plus series that will likely be announced for 2023. The actual release dates. We already know what they are, but the release dates, yeah. I agree. Yeah, exactly. I have two schools of thoughts here. One one of the thoughts is, well, February typically is not that great of a release date. I mean, January is like a dead month, but February is not that great. Now, recently, that's kind of reversed with superhero shows pre-pandemic. We got Deadpool doing a great release twice in February. So maybe it's not the death knell that it once was, but just personally, I'd like to see the Marvels do a little bit better July, big summer blockbuster than in February, but that's just me and Captain Marvel. I want her to have a bigger audience, but I think here you're winning either way because you're getting three great series, three great movies in a row. Boom, boom, boom. And also, you know, we've got talking about other movies coming up. We still have Thor coming up later this year too. So yeah, we're finally getting into production again on the MCU, on the big screen, following the pandemic. And I'm just looking forward to it, including Doctor Strange, which is opening this weekend. So I'm excited to see that when I do, too. The pandemic is so gummy, by the way. Fair enough. Yeah, my, my wife and I will be singing in theaters, and we will be masked the entire time. I'm just waiting for dude bros on the internet to blame this whole thing on Brie Larson. Oh, you know that's coming, too. Especially after the first one. That was a whole change in IMDb, right? Where they stopped, or was it Rotten Tomatoes, where they stopped showing negative reviews or something like that? Yeah, whatever. Anyway, that's the news for this week, and we look forward to what's news next week. We do have some feedback to cover right now. We had some interesting tweets back and forth, posts, I guess is better word for them, over on Discord. Randy Walker yesterday asked a lot of questions about the finale for Moon Knight. Why does Tarawit Avatar have wings and fly? Tarawit is a hippo. Her avatar should be strong or something. This whole series confuses me. It doesn't seem to be related to the greater MCU at all, unless I miss something. Well, first of all, Randy, you didn't miss something. It is not technically a crossover event by design they decided not to do that and we talked at length earlier about its connection with the mcu but he does have an interesting point here about avatars and tarwit and the fact that she's a hippo and hippos fly i mean are we talking like dumbo here sort of thing have you ever met a hippo yeah i've been to a zoo or two yeah the most defining characteristic of a hippo is that they do whatever they feel like. So if Tarawit wants to have her avatar fly and have wings, what are they going to do? You know, hippos can't swim. They walk underwater. 
and they hold their breath and their buoyancy it works out enough to where they just kind of chill out underwater until they decide that they're done being in the water. And also, if you remember the whole sequence, she was just, she was so cute. She is like the best part of this. She's just adorable. I just want, again, I want Leia and, and, and her in the, in the next one. I want that show. She was like, oh, I had like the perfect outfit. So it wasn't so much of like it coming from like the powers and such. It was her going, oh my goodness, I think this would just be so cute on you. And that's what she came up with. And we talked about it before, by the way, the voice of Tara Witt is Antonio Salib, which is her first IMDb credit. And I think she knocked it out of the park. I really enjoyed that here. Absolutely. From a perspective of why they went with that costume, it's because, and there's an article on Marvel.com confirming this, they were going for the MCU's version of the Scarlet Scarab which is an Egyptian character. So they wanted to basically do their homage to that costume and find a way to make it work with Layla and everything because it's an Egyptian character. Scarlet Scarab in the comics is a man. Obviously here they opted to go for, for Layla, but they wanted to maintain that Egyptian connection through the comics into the MCU as the first real Egyptian superhero. So that's where the design of the costume came from. So it was pretty effective, including at the end when she was just covering herself until Jake ostensibly took over the body and was able to defeat Harrow. Also, we had a note from Sasha Ming on Discord. Hello, I've been listening to podcasts. That's how I got here. And so I was curious and I said, which podcast were you listening to? Because we're part of the Gonna Geek Network. So it could have been a lot of different podcasts. So Sasha Ming said, Moon Knight, but way before I was binge listening Defiance podcast. I was late to that party, but loved the show and wanted more. That's how I find you first time. So Sasha, thank you very much for joining us in the Discord and listening to our show. We really appreciate you being a new listener. And I, for one, appreciate you listening to the Voices of Defiance podcast. That was a fun podcast on sci-fi, my only sci-fi podcast that I've produced to date. But this is the one that I produce now, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. So thank you very much for joining us over here. Really appreciate that. All right, Anthony, you got any ideas on what we should do now? I think we should ride out in the back of a limo on the way out and try not to get double tapped. Not getting double tapped is definitely sage advice for any time. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us these past weeks. I know you were five of the six episodes, but you gave us that all important primer a couple of weeks before the series. So you've been a big help to me personally, to our listeners and to Chris. And I know Michelle has also expressed her past. Thank you. So thank you so much for being here with us. It's a pleasure. And. Moon Knight is over, but I hope that this is not the last time that I will make an appearance on this fantastic show. It's been a, a privilege to talk Moon Knight with y'all and to get to hang out in this kind of an environment is always fun. So thank you for inviting me. And like I said, I hope you'll have me back at some point. We'll have to discuss that further. Like Kevin Feige, I'm not in giving the long-term contracts anymore. I mean, I made the mistake with Chris. Now we're stuck with him. So we'll, we'll just have to take it how it goes. But I'll keep you in the phone book. Appreciate that. (laughs) People want to find you in your great material that you do with your co-host. Where can they do that? So our podcast is Capes on the Couch, and we cover the mental health and psychiatric issues of comic book characters and superheroes. And you can find all of our episodes on our website, capesonthecouch.com, or all of the major podcatchers with the exception of Spotify. And we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Capes on the Couch. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Shell underscore game. Again, thank you, Anthony, for um, being here. You um, help, and I hope you do come back. And again, thank you, listeners, for consuming our product. Yes, Anthony, it has been a great time having somebody who knows what to look for on these, because I know at least definitely for me and Michelle, we certainly do not. But if anybody wants to hear more from me, 
usually you can go to playcomics.com, but I didn't put out an episode last week because, quite frankly, I just didn't feel like it. But you can hear me over at a guest appearance on MageCast where I talk to the well-read mage about what is canonically the best, my most favorite Zelda game ever made, Link's Awakening. Also, as a surprise here that SP doesn't even know about, my other podcast where I get to press buttons and say bad words because I feel like the world needs it again, Caffeine and Spite is going to be coming back. Ooh, I do know about that, and I look forward to that as well. Because, you know, I listen to everything my co-hosts are on. I like to keep tabs on them, you know, just in case I need to legally distance myself from them. No, just kidding. I enjoy everything y'all do, so I do that. Also, you can find me most times on Discord. I am on Twitter, but you can find me on Discord most times. I will respond to everything in our Discord server. This is not really a plug for the Discord server. It's really where I'm at most of the time. It's goodygeek.com slash Discord. And I am there to talk to you guys about podcasting, about space stuff, about Marvel stuff, just everything that goes on in there. I will be talking a lot about Picard coming up because I am going to be watching that series starting now. I know it's just ended, but I am going to be starting that as soon as I watch the Halo episode. So I'm really looking forward to that. And we really appreciate you, by the way, listener, for hanging with, in with us, watching Move Night with us, listening to us talk about Moon Knight and everything that we're going to do in the future, including X-Men, while we wait for the next Disney Plus series to drop. So until next time, I'm Director SP. I'm Agent Michelle. I'm Agent Chris. I'm Consultant Anthony. And I'm Director SP saying bye. Bye, Bye, y'all. Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you will find all our contact information and other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod, found at incompetech.com and also artists on pond5.com and audiojungle.net. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual hosts and do not represent Stargate Pioneer Productions, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation, Marvel Studios, and ABC. No infringement is intended. And then at the end with Jake, she's just like, wait, that's just a cold-hearted killer. No wonder why Khonshu likes him. They're both dicks. And I'm like going, yeah, I, <laughs> she actually, that's what she said. I'm like going, yeah, mom, you're right. They are both dicks. I don't want a season two where I have to sit around and watch two dicks do whatever for three to four episodes until we get Steven and Mark back. <laughs> I, I don't think that kind of stuff is allowed on Disney Plus. You you may have to go to Hulu for that. Just just saying, or or maybe the internet. I, I listen. I that that joke wrote itself. I, I, I couldn't know. not. I mean, I was just laughing at how many times you could potentially fit the word. Oh, dick I know. In there. But I, I know exactly what I was saying. I'm glad. I'm glad you all got there. Yeah, we did. We did for sure. Chris, you settled now. Did you just pan to me because you wanted to see me break again? No, I was panning to you because I wanted to hear your reaction, <laughs> but I saw your face. And I'm like, oh, this is a mistake. <laughs> but it's what we had. So you ready? Okay. I mean, I'm with you here. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is copyright 2013 through 2022.